a stunning fact to think about that these were real living, breathing, moving, eating, growing, reproducing, thinking animals that grew from a little hatchling from an egg into something the size of a jet plane. And they were real. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. We make e-readers and apps, we sell e-books and audiobooks, we build technology that helps people spend more time reading, and we do it all because we ourselves love both reading and writers. One of the best parts of the work that we do is that we get to talk with authors about their books, as well as the books that shaped them in their reading and writing lives. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is Steve Brusate. Steve is a paleontologist at the University of Edinburgh and the author of several books about dinosaurs. His new book for young readers and those of us with supple, youthful minds is called The Age of Dinosaurs, The Rise and Fall of the World's Most Remarkable Animals. This book is both highly digestible and utterly stunning in its description of the world in which these truly remarkable animals lived. Steve Brusate, welcome to Kobo. Well, thanks a lot, Michael. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk dinosaurs and talk books. You wrote an adult version of The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, a new history of a lost world that was both a great retrospective of your own career and did a very good job of catching all of us up on what's been happening in paleontology over the last 20 or 30 years. When you turned around and decided to do a book for younger readers, The Age of Dinosaurs, what sparked that desire? Was there a gap for young people about dinosaurs that you wanted to fill in? Well, first of all, thanks for all those nice things you said about the books. I I appreciate that. And I just, I'm so glad that, you know, people have have read uh, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs and it's, it's, you know, made an impact on people. Uh, And it was a, a really fun book to write. It was published uh, three years ago now, my goodness, um, and, uh, and it was a, a pop science book for adults, um, a book that told the story of dinosaur evolution from their origins through their rise to dominance to their extinction, and with that story, I tried to weave in my own stories of digging up dinosaurs and traveling around and working with just such an incredible uh, diversity of colleagues all, all over the world, and and so that book was a lot of fun to write. Uh, And after I wrote that book, um, I thought that it would be fun to make it into something that would be readable for a bit of a younger audience um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, younger uh, kids always love dinosaurs. And, you know, always, (laughs) always. always. And so there is a bit of a gap in the market, though, I think, you know, so for the age of dinosaurs, the new book, which really is a younger reader's version of the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. There is new information in there. There's new people and colleagues and stories, but by and large, it's 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 a story of dinosaur evolution, um, and is for eight to twelve year olds more or less. And I think that's a kind of a time or a time gap or an, an age gap in the market where there, there's so many books on dinosaurs for young kids, the picture books and the encyclopedias. Mm-hmm. And then there's more advanced books um, like The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. But for those kids that are in, you know, middle school or thereabouts, uh, there aren't so many books that are narrative histories of dinosaurs, especially up to date ones. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to do it. And and the other reason, to be honest, is that uh, I know a lot of kids have have read The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs, and I get messages from kids. I just got one a a couple minutes ago, actually. I I was just checking my email before I exited out of it, so it doesn't make the little beeps during the podcast. And I saw saw there's an email from a a 10-year-old kid here in the UK who read the book, and he sent me a picture of himself reading it and just saying he enjoyed it. And and, uh, you know, he wants to come and study in Edinburgh, which I, which I love to hear. So I know that younger kids are reading the book, uh, but I know The Rise and Fall does have a few things in there, scenes of drinking beer and going to crazy conferences and these kind of things that, you know, maybe not every eight or 10 year old wants to read. So, you know, we can take out some of those little things, put in a, a few more kid-friendly stories in, in, into the age of dinosaurs. And we have a book that I think uh, will be interesting and, and hopefully inspiring to that next generation of paleontologists. And that experience of 
reaching out to a paleontologist, you know, writing them a letter or getting with them on the phone is, is something that uh, you have from your own life. You were writing with and talking to paleontologists from a pretty young age, as I recall. Yeah, yeah, I was an insufferable, very annoying, quite audacious uh, dinosaur geek when I was a teenager, and uh, and that's how I really got started with paleontology. I, I wasn't one of those really young kids, you know, the kindergartners that knows all the names and knows how to spell all the names and all that. I wasn't quite one of those dino geeks. My dino geekiness came a bit later, around the time I was starting high school, and it was really because of my youngest brother who who was one of those, uh, you know, grade school, elementary school dinosaur obsessives, he got me into it. And once I got into it, I think maybe because I was a little bit older, I got obsessed in a different way. And, and I, I started to read a lot of books and I started to um, really learn about dinosaurs online. This was in the late 90s. So we just started to get the internet as a family at home. This was a new thing. So I you know, would constantly be going to the web pages of museums and reading about their exhibits. And I would, you know, read um, science magazines and learn about new discoveries and, and that sort of thing online. And the next logical thing to do was to just start emailing paleontologists, <laughs> which I did. Of course. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of them answered, they replied. And I, I, that just blew me away as a 14, 15 year old kid that I was, you know, sitting in, in my parents, you know, living room back in, in, in the middle of nowhere in Illinois, uh, where I grew up, which is a great place to grow up, by the way, a wonderful place in Ottawa, Illinois, but it's, you know, a little bit far out from the big city. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're sitting at home and, and you're connected to these scientists that are making these incredible discoveries, the people whose names are in the newspaper, finding these new dinosaurs and describing these, these lost worlds. And, and that just made a huge impact on me. Uh, and, and then I started to write a lot I, did, I made my own website. This was before there were blogs, really. If I was doing it today, I'd probably, you know, started a blog. But back then, it was the you know, GeoCities website. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, excellent. Uh, yep, and it's I was still out there, archived somewhere for people that want to take a look at my youthful misadventures. <laughs> but uh, but one of the things I did was I I did a lot of interviews with paleontologists. When I emailed them, it wasn't usually just for idle chit chat. It was to ask them to do interviews for my website and for some amateur paleontology magazines and science magazines that I started writing for. And so that's really where I cut my teeth as, as a writer as well. And, and as I think back about that time, you know, I was just learning so much. I was learning the science. I was meeting people. I was getting inspired by real life scientists from all over the world, by the way. I mean, that was a great thing about the internet and still is. I was emailing scientists not only in the U.S., but in Europe and South America and so on. Uh, and I was learning to write. I was, you know, doing my own writing, but also I was learning to work with editors and to write to brief and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So I, I was looking back just incredibly fortunate to have all those experiences coming together at once. See, so you cracked the code at 15 that it took me until now to figure out, which is if you call people up for interviews, then you get to talk to them. It's fantastic. <laughs> and so like, so you would sort of work your way through the, you know, through the phone or email and you, you, you tell a story about, um, about talking to Walter Alvarez, who was yeah. the paleontologist who was responsible for kind of the theory of asteroid impact and and dinosaurs, and like how does that first conversation go? Hi, you know, hi, I'm Steve. Uh, great to meet you. And then what? <laughs> Thinking back to that, um, I, I'm I'm kind of shocked that that it happened. Really, I mean, I I emailed a lot of paleontologists back when I was a teenager. Uh, but, you know, Walter Alvarez was at another level. I mean, he's one of the most eminent geologists mm -hmm. in the world. He was the guy, as you say, who came up with the idea that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. He was the one who first found the evidence for that. Um, and he wrote an excellent book called T-Rex and the Crater of Doom, one of the great titles of, of any book. <laughs> um, of and, any book. Not just any the, book yeah, ever. Yeah. You know, yeah. War and Peace and then T-Rex and the Crater of Doom and, you know, so on. Um, but, uh, but, 
But, you know, and he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's an emeritus professor at Berkeley. You know, he's as big of a name as you can get. His father was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Louis Alvarez, who, um, you know, helped d develop the atomic bomb. And that wasn't even what he won the prize for. You know, all, just a pedigree uh, and accomplishments as a scientist that are really rivaled by by very few in the world and, and and I email this guy and he responds and then we talk on the phone and we do an interview you know and I publish the interview in an amateur magazine and uh, I ask you know ask him for directions to the the place where he first found those geological clues uh in the rock record which is in Italy um you know in in the sequence of rocks dated to exactly that time that the dinosaurs disappear as fossils you know, he found this chemical fingerprint that could really only come from an asteroid. And, you know, I asked him directions for how to, how to go there. And, 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 you know, I mean, it wasn't very feasible to get there. But then lo and behold, like several years later, I'm on a, a college geology trip and we're there in Italy and he's there. He happens to be there at the same time. You know, and, and we're there at the place. He's pointed out to me and my classmates, this is where I first took the rock sample, where I found the chemical that showed there was an asteroid. I mean, it, it's it's almost too good to be true, the story. And, and and I write about it in in the Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. And also I talk about it in, in the Age of Dinosaurs. Um, and, you know, I all I can say is I can assure you it's a true story. It sounds completely fabricated, but it's true. And I... You know, I, it's just another example of um, being very fortunate, being at the right place at the right time. That's happened a lot for me. And, uh, you know, just ha having people, having mentors, having advisors, having colleagues that have been very generous, very supportive, very inspirational throughout. And the last thing I'll just say about that is when I look back on it, I, I find it crazy that I would just call them up on the phone when I was in high school at my actual high school, I was very introverted. You know, I was somebody who only had a small group of friends. I had no idea like how to talk to girls, none of that stuff. But I was like calling up these eminent, you know, National Academy of Sciences members and just kind of chewing the fat and asking them directions to their fav favorite rock <laughs> album. So I, I, I don't know how it happened, but it did. Yeah. So. <laughs> but what I, one of the things that I love about the age of dinosaurs is that it is it is in no way a dumbed down book you know having having read both the version for adults and the version for for younger readers it follows a similar structure the same science is in there there are a few things taken out but there are also a few things added in you have no problem dropping a box in the middle of a chapter because you want to make sure that readers understand evolution and natural selection and then right back into the the paleontology so were you were you thinking about what you would have liked in a book at that age as you were putting this together and trying to figure out what stays and what goes? I was thinking about, especially about my brother Chris, who who was my youngest brother, who got me into dinosaurs. What what he would have been looking for, kind of at that age eight to twelve stage, mm -hmm. because at that age I wasn't into dinosaurs yet. So it, it's a this kind of book is is a book I never would have even picked up, but he would have. I know he would have. And I, I, I hope he would have liked it. You know, he, he would probably be my my harshest critic there, um, although he would only say nice things about it. Uh, but I, you know, it was a kid like him who big into dinosaurs, collected dinosaur stuff. You know, his bedroom was a dinosaur museum. It really was. Like he even gave it a name, you know, the Dino Land Museum. And uh, he had a library. He had over a hundred dinosaur books. So a kid like that who was so into dinosaurs, who was smart, who was enthused about dinosaurs, who was every time went to the bookstore, looked at the dinosaur section to see if there was something new. I was thinking about a kid like that. And one thing I, I did not want to do was to, to dumb it down or to talk down. I didn't want to, you know, underestimate the intelligence and the creativity of an eight to 12 year old reader. My wife's a school teacher here in Edinburgh. And I mean, there's a student at her school uh, that, um, the last time I was in before COVID asked me about a dinosaur. You know, what do you think about this dinosaur? And I, I hadn't heard of the dinosaur. I had to go home and look it up. It was a new dinosaur. There's like 50 new species that are named every year. Now it's the crazy, exciting, you know, most golden age time in the history of the field. And this kid, you know, knew one of these new dinosaurs. So I didn't want to talk down 
to kids like that. That does mean that The Age of Dinosaurs, it is a little bit different of a book. You know, it's not a picture book. It, it has plenty of pictures. It has artwork, illustrations. It has photos of dinosaur digs. It has a lot of photos of my colleagues. So kids can see what real paleontologists look like and all of our diversity. But it's not one of these big, bold, colorful, in-your-face picture books with T-Rexes chomping down on triceratopses and blood dripping from their faces and that kind of thing. Not that we don't also love those ones. Those are those are also very good. <laughs> and I have written those kind of books before. And believe me, I have nothing against the whole blood and gore and chasing down prey and roaring and stomping and all that kind of stuff. I mean, come on, we all love mm -hmm. that too. But in this book, um, I, I wanted to, to really respect the intelligence of, of the kids that hopefully will be reading it. And I wanted to tell them the story of dinosaur evolution. And I wanted to give them a realistic look into what it's like to be a paleontologist. So it is a narrative book. It does you know, start at the beginning of the time of dinosaurs and follows them through their evolution. I do have these boxes interspersed throughout the book where I kind of take a little detour from the main narrative and introduce colleagues or introduce um, a certain concept like evolution by natural selection or uh, introduce what it's like to dig up dinosaurs and the tools we use. Um, but by and large, it's a narrative book, a chapter book from, from start to finish. Um, and it's probably in many ways a bit more like a novel, like a young adult novel than it is a dinosaur encyclopedia or picture book of the kind mm -hmm. that we're all familiar with. Now, I had my dinosaur era from age probably seven to ten. Um, and that was when I knew every dinosaur in all of the illustrated books that were in my library or reconstructed in the museum closest to where I live. And... The, and then, you know, then I stopped. So let's assume that my knowledge of dinosaurs has locked in sometime in the 1980s with then enough of a Jurassic Park refresher to make me afraid of velociraptors, but, but not much else. So if that's my background, what are the biggest leaps that have been made in the intervening years in our understanding of dinosaurs that I almost certainly don't know? Well... So many people, Michael, are like you, learned about dinosaurs in school, seen Jurassic Park, maybe seen all of the Jurassic Parks. Um, and, and, and that's kind of where, where the knowledge stops. Of course, you know, m most people g might like dinosaurs as kids, but go on to do other things. Um, and maybe you occasionally see a, a, an mm -hmm. article in the news or you see something flash on oh, social media. Yeah, there is the occasional article that makes its way into mainstream media that lets you know that the, 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 um, the field is still progressing. Yep. Yep, exactly. And, and that's what the vast majority of people see. But my goodness, there's so much. There's so much to catch up on because the field is moving so fast. And what we know about dinosaurs now uh, has just advanced so tremendously on, on what was known when you and I were both in school in, in, in the 80s and, and, and early 90s. Um, and, and that's one of the main reasons I wrote The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. I was, when I wrote that book, my audience, what I was thinking in my head as I wrote it was, you know, I want to reach the sorts of people that liked dinosaurs as a kid. And if they see a dinosaur story go viral on Twitter, they click on it and they take a look at the pictures and they, they you know, look at the, the first few sentences of mm -hmm. it. Um, but, you know, they've, they've lost the, the trail. I mean, they know T-Rex, Triceratops, Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. Um, but so much has changed and, and we know so much more. We're in, as I said, this golden age now, 50 some new species every year, more people looking for dinosaurs than ever before. Not just the Indiana Jones looking guys that used to be pretty much the only paleontologist mm -hmm. out there, or at least the majority of paleontologists. You know, it's people all over the world, young people, women, men, people of all nationalities. I wanted to show that new science of dinosaurs to people broadly. And, and, and so that's what I thought when I was writing the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. Uh, and so then with translating it down to a younger reader's version with the age of dinosaurs, I want to show that to kids. I, and I wanted to be, you know, very open, very accurate uh, about what we know about dinosaurs now. And I want, wanted to show uh, kids out there what it's like to be a paleontologist, what it's like to hunt for dinosaurs and to study dinosaurs and to show kids real paleontologists at work 
and not just um, you know names and pictures, although there are plenty of, of you know those in the book, but but showing how it all weaves together into one story, how we've learned so much uh, so recently about dinosaurs and how we are still learning. And that's the thing, we are still learning and people are still finding so many new dinosaurs and there are still so many mysteries that need to be solved. Yeah. One of the things that that knocked me out as I was reading it was just the pace at which new discoveries are made. You know, as you say, a new species every week and that never have more new species been identified as are happening right now. That's right. That's right. I, and I know it sounds really cliched and every time I say it, I cringe a little bit, but the golden age, it really is. It really is. You know, it, it is, the I think, the most exciting time uh, in the history of paleontology. Certainly, it's the time over the last 10 to 15 years or so where people have found more dinosaurs than they ever have in the past. And it's not only the finding of new fossils, but it's the tools we use to study fossils. It's, it's being able to use CAT scanners to see inside the heads of dinosaurs and see what their brains were like and their ears were like. It's being able to use computer modeling to build accurate digital 3D models of dinosaurs to test out how they moved and how they stood and if they could run and if they could fly. It's using really high powered microscopes to actually see the little pigment cells on dinosaur fossils that tell us what color they were. It's all of these things coming together over the last 10 to 15 years. And it really is because there's more people looking than ever before all around the world. You know, a vast, the vast majority of the new discoveries are, are not from the US or Canada or Western Europe, although there are still plenty of new fossils uh, in, in those places. But the vast majority of new Dinosaurs are coming from China, from Argentina, from Brazil, from South Africa, from these big countries that are developing, opening up, training a new generation of scientists. And I think that's just really exciting. Is it the case that we're we're filling in a picture that we already have a fairly good sense of in terms of our understanding of how uh, of how dinosaurs you know lived, were constructed? Um, or are we are we seeing breakthroughs in that understanding where some parts of the field are just getting turned upside down? It's it's both. Um, it, it is both. There's certainly areas of dinosaur research where we are filling in gaps where we used to know that you know this one group of dinosaurs kind of originated at this one time and place, and then we know it went extinct at some time, but we didn't know much in the middle, and we're finding new species. So there is plenty of that. We are fleshing out the family tree of dinosaurs bit by bit, literally every week. But it's, it is more than that. There are big mysteries that are being solved. There's new mysteries that are now emerging. And there's so many new tools for studying dinosaurs. And, and I think probably the, the best example I can give is this issue of, of dinosaur color. You know, when I was, was in uh, school in the late 80s and, and early 90s, you know, before I was really interested in dinosaurs, but of course we had lessons about dinosaurs in school, in preschool and kindergarten and in elementary school. And of course there were always these books about dinosaurs in the classroom. And I remember these books often saying things like, we don't know what color dinosaurs were. We'll never know what color dinosaurs were. All we have are their bones and their teeth, you know? So use your imagination. Right. Maybe they were green and scaly like lizards or maybe they were brown and, Maybe they were purple or polka dot or whatever. Use your imaginations. Well, we now can tell what color some dinosaurs were. Shockingly, you know, if these dinosaur fossils that we sometimes find, if they have feathers or have skin, if they have really well-preserved soft tissues, we can put them under high-powered microscopes. We can see the actual pigment cells, the little bubbles that held pigment. And we know from modern animals today, that different shapes of those bubbles correspond to different colors. That blows my mind. And that was discovered only about 10 years ago. And it was a student, a PhD student, a friend of mine, a guy named Jakob Winther, who came from Denmark and moved to the US to study. He figured it out. He figured it out. He was looking at some fossils under the microscope. He figured it out as a student. You know, so, so that's an example of a really revolutionary new way of looking at dinosaurs has only come to light recently. You took a, a run at that in, in 2008, where you made a great big illustrated coffee table book, 
called dinosaurs where you um where you had computer generated models of 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 dinosaurs made so that people could see what they looked like was that at the time that that new understanding was coming forward or was it just before that it was just before that as far as our understanding of dinosaur color okay. um so so the first dino actually i'm i have to double check. Um, I always want to be accurate as a scientist, but I think it was 2008 itself when the first papers on, on color and the fossil record of that way, you know, came out. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned that book. That was, you know, a book that I did when I was a student and it was something that just kind of happened. Of, you know, I, I got to know some people at a, at a publisher, a publishing house called Quercus in, in London, and they had an idea for a dinosaur book. And, um, you know, one thing led to another and, and, what they wanted to do was make the biggest dinosaur book ever. And by that, I mean, physically the largest. <laughs> so, Size so, appropriate. Exactly. And, you know, and I love doing that book. It's very much a dinosaur book that is nature red in tooth and claw. It is big pictures of dinosaurs, dinosaurs baring their teeth, dinosaurs biting each other, blood and guts and spit and gore and, you know, and, and, and the fun, the kind of the movie monster aspect of dinosaurs. And I, I, you know, and I like those kind of books. Kids like those kind of books. It's inspiring in, in its own way. Um, but the age of dinosaurs that I've done now is probably like the exact opposite, really, <laughs> of that kind of book. And so for me, it's fun to be able to have worked on different types of books over the years with different editors and different publishers and just try to reach people using different styles and different approaches. The the beginning and the end of The Age of Dinosaurs is they're bracketed by mass extinction. And we, I think most of us know the end of dinosaurs as a result of a mass extinction event. But you start the book at a quarry in Poland looking at the end of the Permian period. Can you describe what that version of the world looked like and how its ending then began the age of dinosaurs? Yeah, this is one of the, the fascinating things about dinosaurs. I, I, I think everybody knows, or at least many people know, dinosaurs died because of an asteroid. Okay, maybe it's a little more complicated, but this huge asteroid hit the earth, the dinosaurs died. But what's kind of freaky and kind of eerie is that the age of dinosaurs itself began with another extinction. It, it was another huge mass die-off that really opened up space and paved the way for dinosaurs. It gave them their opportunity. And this happened at the end of what geologists call the Permian period. And this was about 250 million years ago. And the world back then was very different than the world today. I mean, it would have been scarcely recognizable. This was the age of Pangaea, the supercontinent. So all of the land was globbed together into this one giant landmass that literally stretched from the North Pole to the South Pole. And there were no ice caps. It was hot, it was dry, it was a very harsh world. And the interior of Pangaea, much of it was desert, just harsh, inhospitable, even impassable in many places, desert. But of course, there were many plants and animals that were adapted to that world. And it was a world where many of our early mammal predecessors were dominant. Not quite true mammals. True mammals came later. And that's actually the subject of my next book, which I'm, I'm just wrapping up now. But, um, but these were the, the antecedents of mammals. And, and they were at the top of the food chain. They lived all over the world. There were big saber-toothed flesh eaters. There were giant pot-bellied plant eaters and everything in between. They were adapted to that desert supercontinent. But then these big volcanoes started to erupt. And they erupted in what's now Siberia. And, and these were not normal volcanoes. This is not Mount St. Helens or the Hawaiian volcanoes. Nothing like that. These were, were basically big gashes in the earth. It's like if, if you know, some, if you took a giant machete and just slashed open the earth and you had these big canyons that just belched out lava for hundreds of thousands of years. And that lava covered a huge amount of what is now Asia. And, and even today, 250 million years later, the rocks that form from that lava still cover a land area about 
equivalent in size to all of Western Europe put together, which is crazy. So a huge amount of lava, but but coming up with that lava was the real problem, the real killer, the silent killer. And that was the carbon dioxide and the methane and the nasty greenhouse gases that rode up with the lava, went into the atmosphere, caused runaway global warming, and that led to a mass extinction. And up to 95% of all species died out. The warming was so intense and so extreme. But there were some survivors. And one of those survivors was a small little reptile, probably just about the size of a house cat. It would have weighed only a few pounds. You could have held it in your arms. And that was the progenitor, the predecessor, the ancestor of the dinosaurs. And we first start seeing a, a record of the very, very first little proto dinosaurs in rocks that were formed right after those volcanoes. And those rocks are in Poland of all places. Maybe Poland's not a place you think of when you think of fossils and discovering dinosaurs, but you can discover fossils anywhere if you have rocks of the right age. And in Poland, there are these quarries where they mine clay to make bricks. And the, the, the clay that's being mined, layer after layer of it, uh, full of fossils. And especially fossil footprints and handprints, the, the little traces that animals back then left behind. And we see the dainty little delicate little handprints and footprints of this cat-sized proto-dinosaur starting to prosper. And one of the things you described so well in, in both The Age of Dinosaurs and The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs is how often dinosaurs and proto-dinosaurs weren't alone that they were often competing with other non-dinosaur rivals and that there was a long time when the rise of the dinosaurs wasn't a foregone conclusion. And that kind of this next era was, you know, had a long period where maybe they were going to be the dominant life form and maybe they weren't. Yeah, that's one of the twists and turns of the dinosaur story. And it's one of the more unexpected parts of the dinosaur story. And it's something we've really only learned over the last couple of decades as we found more fossils of the earliest dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs got their opportunity because that mass extinction cleared off so many other animals, including so many of those early mammal relatives that had been dominant up to that point. And then you had these small little cat-sized proto-dinosaurs surviving the extinction and then prospering afterwards. But there were other survivors too. And from the survivors also came the first turtles, the first crocodiles, the first lizards, the first pterodactyls, even the very first true mammals. And so you had all of these new types of animals jostling for position on that supercontinent as the world healed from that terrible extinction. And this was in what's called the Triassic period. It's the time that followed the Permian period. And the Triassic period was a time of great evolutionary experimentation because you had all these survivors, wide open playing field, and they were competing with each other. And, and for tens of millions of years, the dinosaurs were part of that story, but they were not the leaders of that story. They were not the lead actors. They, they were not the dominant ones. They were not at the top of the food chain. They were really still in the shadows. And it was the crocodiles and their relatives that were the really dominant preeminent ones. They were the most diverse animals on land. There were meat eaters and plant eaters. There were crocs that had spikes and horns. There were crocs that ate plants. There were crocs that had beaks and no teeth. There were crocs that walked on two legs, all kinds of diversity. And they were the ones that were really eclipsing the dinosaurs until about 200 million years ago. That's when the Triassic period ended. The Triassic period ended with another extinction. So I think you're starting to see a theme here. You have these extinctions. And extinctions, I mean, we, we think of extinction as a bad thing. And in our world today, it really is. There are lots of things dying out. It is not good. We want to conserve what we have here. But throughout Earth history, of course, species are always rising up and going extinct. But there are these periods of time where lots of species go extinct at these mass extinctions, and they are, are, are the pacemakers of the history of life. They, they really have determined, orchestrated in many ways, um, you know, 
how life has unfolded. So at the end of the Triassic period, what happened was that supercontinent began to split apart. And of course it did. I mean, if it didn't, you know, we wouldn't have the separate continents we have today. So that's why we have Africa and South America that are separated, but, you know, fit together or would fit together like puzzle pieces. They split apart at the end of the Triassic period. North America split from Europe and, and so on. Now, as that happened and the supercontinent cracked open, eventually water filled those gaps. The Atlantic Ocean essentially is, is what now marks that 200 million year old dividing line. But before the water came in, the earth once again bled lava. And it was another time of these mega volcanoes. And it was another time of lots and lots and lots of lava, but also a lot of greenhouse gases coming up with the lava. So you had another global warming episode. You had another mass extinction. That mass extinction decimated the crocodiles. Almost all of that diversity of the early crocs was wiped out. Only a few little lineages made it through. These were the ancestors of today's crocodiles and alligators. You know, scary animals, you don't want to run into one, but really there's not that many of them. There's only about 25 species. Mm -hmm. They all live in pretty similar subtropical environments of that interface between water and land. That's because almost all of the croc diversity was lost at the end of the Triassic. But the dinosaurs were the great survivors of that extinction. And then afterwards, they had this largely empty world to make their own. And I wish I had a good answer for why they were able to survive and the crocs were hit so hard, but I don't have a good answer. This has now emerged as one of the biggest remaining mysteries about dinosaurs. Why did they have what it, whatever it took to get through that extinction? Did they grow faster? Could they run faster? Did they, were they warm blooded? Did they have feathers? Were they smarter? Were they just lucky? I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I know that it's one of the big mysteries that remains to be solved by the next generation of paleontologists. One of the the interesting things about your career is that you've you've dipped in and out of um, out of various time periods in the in the historical record, and then done you know, very deep dives in in a few specific areas. Tell me a bit about. Carcharodontosaur, and why this dinosaur was important to you and how you began as a paleontologist. It's a really important dinosaur to me personally, but also in the grand history of dinosaurs. When it comes to the grand history of dinosaurs, it was one of the very biggest meat-eating dinosaurs that ever lived. It was nearly the size of T-Rex, which is the record holder, uh, but it lived earlier than T-Rex. And it was kind of the, the, the dinosaur that filled that top predator niche in the ecosystem before T-Rex did. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about something that was about 40 feet long, 13 meters or so long, that weighed several tons, that had a head that was the size of a bathtub, you know, that could, could just nip your head off and, you know, one easy bite, that kind of dinosaur ferocious dinosaur, one of those red and tooth and claw dinosaurs that we mm -hmm. all love. And so that's why it's important in the overall story of dinosaur evolution. And it was really only with the extinction of Carcharodontosaurus and the other Carcharodontosaurs that Tyrannosaurus had the opportunity to come in and, and take that top role in the ecosystem. But from a, a more personal standpoint, it was the first dinosaur I ever studied. So, you know, I was the, the high school teenage dino geek. And then, at, you know, at some point, I guess pretty much after like my freshman year of high school, you know, I, I, I knew that I wanted to do this for a career. And so, you know, I looked into that and I determined I would need to study either geology or biology as an undergraduate. And, and I did. And I went to the University of Chicago, which was you know, the local university. Um, so I you know, grew up in Northern Illinois. And um, there's a great professor in Chicago, a guy named Paul Serino, who is a, a famous dinosaur hunter. He's discovered dinosaurs all over the world. He's especially done a lot of work in, in Africa. And um, he discovered a skull of Carcharodontosaurus in Morocco in the early 90s. And then he discovered more bones of Carcharodontosaurus in the country of Niger uh, later on in the 90s. 
And so when I went to Chicago, I, you know, I, I had met Paul at a, at a few talks he had given in the Chicago suburbs. Um, and I, of course, corresponded with him over email and interviewed him for my website and for the magazines I was writing for. And that's another recurring theme. You know, the, the, the three advisors I've had as an undergrad, a master student, and a PhD student, I got to know all of them as a teenager through the interviews I did and the emails and stuff that I sent. But incredible how that worked out. But Paul, you know, he was a local guy. He grew up in the suburbs. He was very much like a Chicago area guy. So, you know, I just felt a connection with him and I really wanted to study with him. And when I went to college, um, I started volunteering in his lab right away. And, you know, after I, um, you know, cut my teeth with, with learning fossil conservation and, and fossil preparation and, and, and so on, um, I asked if, if I could start doing some research on, on some fossils. And there was a summer program uh, at the university and he came up with the project. He took me to one of the drawers, one of the cabinets that he had and he opened the drawer and he said, here's a bunch of bones. <laughs> and they were a bunch of huge bones from the face of a meat eating dinosaur. And he said, I found these uh, in, in Niger a few years back, and I think they're a new species of Carcharodontosaurus, but I don't know for sure. And here you go, have at it, spend the summer with them. And so I was just mesmerized. And, and I spent that summer describing those bones, photographing those bones, comparing them to other dinosaurs. And we did determine it was a new species and we named it as a new species. Uh, and that, that was my first experience as a dinosaur researcher. That was really when I made that jump between a dino geek and a dinosaur researcher. And mm -hmm. thank God that I liked it, you know, because <laughs> it's taking a passion and turning it into a career is, is always tough, but, but it worked in this case. And I just loved every moment of working with those bones. They were 95 to 100 million year old, million years old, those bones and scrutinizing all the details and making the comparisons with other dinosaurs and envisioning what this thing was like when it was alive. It was intoxicating. And, you know, I knew from then on that I definitely made the right choice. That time of Carcara dinosaur and uh, sort of corresponded with the the rise well, the literal rise of dinosaurs in terms of them starting to get really big and you wax almost poetic about the size of dinosaurs as we get you know in you know into the triassic and then the, then into the jurassic um and especially the the sauropods the long-necked dinosaurs like brachiosaurus and, and diplodocus how um, you spend some time talking about how it was possible for them to get so big and grow so fast. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, it was one of the most fascinating parts of the book for me. Yeah. So for so many of us, you know, one of the reasons why we become enthralled with dinosaurs when we're young or or later on in life, whenever is because some of them were so huge. Some of them were massive. They were enormous. They were of a scale just totally outside the norm of anything we see around us today. And the biggest dinosaurs of all, things like Brontosaurus and Diplodocus, these long neck plant eating dinosaurs, they were bigger than, you know, not only many elephants put together, they, some of them were bigger than Boeing 737 airplanes, which is, is, is a stunning, fact to think about, that these were real living, breathing, moving, eating, growing, reproducing, thinking animals that grew from a little hatchling from an egg into something the size of a jet plane. And they were real. I mean, you, you go to a museum, you stand underneath the skeleton of an animal like this, and, and this used to be a real creature. And in fact, there were many species of these things, and they lived for over 100 million years, and they were the biggest animals that have ever lived on land in the entire history of the Earth. The only things that have been bigger have been some whales, which live in the water, which is a whole different, you know, realm. Mm -hmm. um, the blue whale, and I, you know, and I do have to say, I mean, Right now, the blue whale is still with us, and it is the biggest animal, period, that has ever lived. So if, if you're blown away by a brontosaurus, great, but let's also appreciate that living right now with us is the very biggest animal ever, which I think is cool. But anyway, that's a digression. But, um, you know, the, 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 the sauropods were huge. They were 
biblically huge. And there has long been this mystery of why they were able to get so big. And why have mammals on land not been able to get that big? And it used to be thought that maybe there was something different about the environment back then. Maybe there was more oxygen in the air. Maybe gravity was weaker. Who knows? But it turns out that's not the case. Uh, it was really the animals themselves. They had this intrinsic evolutionary potential to get so big because they happened upon a perfect body type for getting so they had the long necks, they could reach high up into the trees, they had access to a never ending all you can eat buffet of plants that no other dinosaurs could get to. So they could fuel themselves that way. And then they had these lungs that were super efficient. They were lungs like birds have today. We know that because these very special lungs leave marks on the bones because there's these air sacs that stick out from the lungs that can actually invade the bones. And these air sacs are key to making those lungs more efficient than the lungs of mammals because those air sacs can store extra oxygen rich air. So these giant dinosaurs could take in more oxygen than mammals. So that just means that they had more fuel in addition to the fuel from their food, they had more fuel from the oxygen they could bring in. And those air sacs, they helped lighten the skeleton. So these dinosaurs could be really big, but they could also move pretty easily. And those air sacs helped cool the body down. They were like an air conditioning system. So you put all those things together and they just have this unprecedented capability of getting big. And mammals, at least on land, don't have those things. Our lungs are less efficient. You know, our, our bones are denser uh, and so on. In that idea of you know, both the scale of dinosaurs, but also the, the kind of the speed of growth of dinosaurs. You, you talk a bit about Tyrannosaurus rex, who was in some ways the ultimate, like, grow fast, die young um, <laughs> example that we see here. Like, they had to get very big very quickly. Yep, T. Rex was the uh, the James Dean of dinosaurs. That's what <laughs> what we often say. I know a little bit cliched there as well, but it did live fast and it did die young, and that was another stunning realization. This this was realized about 15 years ago, uh, and you can actually tell the age of a, an individual dinosaur bone. If you find a dinosaur bone, you can cut it open, and there's rings inside of the bone, just like in a tree trunk. And dinosaurs would would lay down one ring every year. So you can cut open the bone if you want to dare cut open a dinosaur bone uh, and uh, you can count the rings. And so people started to do this and something really interesting emerged. And that is that of all the T-Rexes that were ever cut up, none of them had more than 30 growth rings. So no T-Rex that we know of ever lived past 30 years old. And so I, you know, would be now fairly long dead if I was a T-Rex, which is crazy. I mean, these are huge animals. People used to think that they got big. They got to be the size of a bus because they grew slowly for many, many, many decades, maybe even centuries, kind of like an iguana grows or a turtle. But no, they grew really fast for a short period of time. Then they got really big and then they died. And that is a, an incredible growth strategy. It's something that would have required a lot of energy. It would have required a really high metabolism. And this is part of the argument that uh, many dinosaurs may have had warm-blooded metabolism like we do. In the book, you don't just talk about the, the dinosaurs themselves and the, the periods that they lived in. You also highlight some of the characters of paleontology who literally broke ground in the field. Um, it, and some of the stories are fantastic. Tell me a little bit about, and let's see if I get this name right, Zofia Kielan Jaroska. That's correct. She's one of the greats, one of my heroes, uh, and I was just very privileged looking back on it to have been able to meet her. Uh, she passed away about five years ago. And uh, I, I, I met her in Poland uh, a few years before she died. She was few months short of her 90th birthday, I believe, when she passed away. Zofia was uh, one of the great paleontologists, uh, really of all time. 
uh, for both dinosaurs and for mammals. More than anything, she's known as a mammal expert. And so I'm writing this book on mammals now. It's a follow-up to the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. It'll be another adult pop science book, and that it'll be out probably the summer of 2022, if, if the schedule goes to plan. Uh, but Zofia is a, a big character in that book because she discovered the best record of mammal fossils that lived during the time of dinosaurs. And these fossils helped reveal that mammals were a lot more interesting and diverse while they were living in the shadows of the dinosaurs than we used to think. Uh, but when it comes to dinosaurs, she also found a lot of fossils of dinosaurs alongside the mammals, including some of the giant long neck dinosaurs, including some really weird theropod dinosaurs, some cousins of T. rex, but weird ones that had gone vegetarian and had grown these enormous uh, Edward Scissorhands looking claws. Uh, and then Velociraptor, you know, she found and her, her team uh, dug up the most interesting, most amazing, most iconic fossil of Velociraptor ever that was actually buried and fossilized while it was fighting uh, its prey species, this little horned dinosaur. And, and, and she found many, many others. Uh, and so she was just one of the great field paleontologists, but she was also one of the first women that ever led a major international expedition. She was Polish, she worked with the Mongolians, they had for nearly a decade, the series of annual expeditions, and she trained many other young female scientists uh, that went on to become giants in their own right. Uh, and, and so you had this entire generation of, of, especially in Poland, of female scientists that were world leading and that just wasn't the case. We're talking about the 60s and the 70s. You know, this wasn't the case in many other parts of the world. There were some female paleontologists, but uh, but but uh, not a huge number. Of course, it's changing now. Things are are getting more equal. Uh, there still are gaps, of course. Uh, but it was it was a stunning thing at that time, and those expeditions were legendary. I mean, these were real expeditions. This isn't like me going off to Poland now and digging in some quarries where they, you know, mine clay to make bricks. You know, this isn't me going out to the Scottish islands. I mean, that's all fun. It's cool. We find new fossils. But like what Sophia and her crews did, I mean, they, they would go to the middle of the desert and just set themselves loose. I mean, there were no roads, there were no trails. They just had their maps, their compasses. They knew a little bit about the geology and they would go on the hunt for fossils. They would go, you know, have to drive days and days to their field sites. They, there would, you know, be places where there was no water. They would have to determine where to camp based on where there was any water, you know? And, and, and you can just imagine the, the, the difficulty of those trips, but the adventure of those trips and the, the fossils they discovered uh, a lot of which are, are in Poland, in Warsaw, and I, you know, had a great time studying some of those fossils. Um, it, it's just an, an amazing legacy to have. And so I, I just feel it's a very special feeling that I was able to meet her. She wrote, you know, not only many scientific papers, but also a couple of popular books, which are, are great adventure stories. She wrote one called In Pursuit of Early Mammals, uh, which is a great read. Um, and, and I, you know, it's just one of those special kind of moments that, that I'm just really grateful that I was able to, to have a few hours with her. We visited her home in Poland after we did some field work. And, um, you know, I'm glad I have my camera there too <laughs> to, to, to record it. And then just to give a sense of, you know, how much the the boys club has has broken down, I, let's, you know, let's go to kind of most recent times. Tell me a bit about uh, Yingmai O'Connor. So Jingmei is a, a friend and colleague of mine. She's about my age. Uh, she's now the curator at the Field Museum in Chicago, which is my kind of closest thing to a hometown museum growing up. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very jealous of Jingmei that she has that job. Uh, but it's great. It's, it's so awesome for her. It's such a premier job uh, in the field. Um, she had been working in China for, for many years before that. Um, she grew up in, in, in Southern California. Uh, so she's traveled around the world and, and as a student and then as a, a young professor in China and now as a curator at the Field Museum during that journey, uh, she's become the world's leading expert on the, on the early evolution of birds. And she's described countless numbers of these beautiful fossils of birds, mostly from China, but from other places in the world too. And these are fossils that have feathers and wings and sometimes even internal organs preserved. 
And so she's written that story of how uh, evolution took a dinosaur and turned it into a bird and then how those first birds diversified and ultimately led to the birds of today. Uh, so she's a top-notch scientist, one of the world's leading paleontologists, but also just a really fun person. You know, she DJs on the side. <laughs> um, she, she's, the, the, you know, she, she has lots of tattoos. She's really trendy in the way she dresses. I mean, you know, maybe we shouldn't talk about these things, but actually I think we should. And, and that's why in, in books like, you know, The Age of Dinosaurs, I put pictures of people in because I want kids to see that paleontologists come in all different flavors. I mean, we're just people. And, and some of us are men, still the majority, but many, many young women now making a huge impact in the field. But there's paleontologists of all different kinds of nationalities, all different kinds of backgrounds. We look differently, we dress differently, we talk differently. We're just people. And I think there is a bit of a perception with a lot of scientists that scientists are you know, geniuses, you know, or Einsteins, that kind of thing. It's just, not, it's not true. <laughs> We're just people <laughs> that become interested in things, enthused about the world. We're curious. We find a way to study science and, and we make a career in it the same way you can make a career in anything. You know, it takes time. It takes training. It takes luck. Uh, but there's just no reason that any kid out there should look at, at paleontology and think that that's something I can't do. I mean, no, that's, that's crazy. I mean, there's people like me and Jingmei and, and others all over the world that have come from almost any type of background. And, and in fact, many of the greatest fossil discoveries are made by people who aren't even paleontologists. I mean, so many of the most important fossils found over the last few decades have been made by farmers, by construction workers, by hikers. Mm -hmm. You don't need a degree, you don't need a PhD, you don't need to be a professor uh, to find a fossil or really even to study fossils, to learn about fossils. It is such an accessible science and it's a real populist science, I have to say, in a good way. You know, and, and you can't, and that's not the case with nuclear physics or you know, with, with particle physics or cosmology or whatever, but it is the case with paleontology. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a second. I mean, as an academic, you write a lot. Your list of publications is, is very long, but writing for a popular audience is a very different thing. Were there authors that you looked to as you were finding your own style to write about paleontology for a wider audience? I really love trying to reach out of the scientist bubble and the, the, the technical writing bubble and, and write for and com communicate with a, a broader audience. Um, the, the major part of my job is, let's face it, it's, it's writing scientific papers. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. currency to be a, a practicing scientist and a faculty member at a university. You, you do experiments, you do field work, you find things, you describe things, and you write it up for your colleagues in a very, very technical, very structured way, which is fine. You can have some fun with, with that kind of writing, but it's the kind of writing that very few people read. It's for a hyper-specialized audience, and it's a little bit weird, I have to say, writing about something as big and, and awesome as say a Carcharodontosaurus or a T-Rex, you know, using the language of formal scientific writing. It just, ah, it just seems to, to just be the, the wrong medium for that. What I'm, getting, what I'm getting the sense of is that it's not like you're having to figure out how to take this to a popular audience. It's you're trying to figure out how to pack your enthusiasm into an academic article. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I, you know, and with dinosaurs, it's just the sort of subject that, is intrinsically interesting to people. And you can make connections with people, people that would probably never read another book on science might read one on dinosaurs. The same way that there's, you know, certain mm -hmm. types of, of history say that, you know, I would never read a book on so many things, but ooh, a book on, you know, that aspect of World War II, that would hook somebody like me in as a non-historian. You know, dinosaurs are like that. And so there's just this um, potential and this opportunity to communicate with people. And there have been other scientists, of course, that have done this for a long time. There have been a lot of great scientist writers that have worked on dinosaurs or worked on other fossils. And I've been inspired by a lot of them, you know, Stephen Jay Gould, and Peter Ward, and 
Mike Benton, who is my master supervisor, has written a lot of popular books. Bob Bacher and Jack Horner were leading paleontologists in the 80s and 90s, and they wrote some excellent popular science books. And uh, now there's, there's a, a, a new generation of, of science writers, too. And there's just several books, um, and, and not just books, but, you know, blogs and um, just articles in, in whether it's publications or online magazines or so on. People like Riley Black, who, who she's an incredible writer, um, has always been inspirational to me. These are the type of people that uh, I aspire to to kind of be like when I do my writing. And, and so um, I hope that whatever I put out on the page can, can maybe help inspire the next generation. That's what I'm always thinking of. When you were writing for younger readers, I understand your wife, Anne, helped a lot there. Yeah, she, she did. So Anne's a school teacher uh, here in Edinburgh and you know she has a, a, a history degree and um, and uh, a master's in education so she's done the whole kind of academic route too and uh, we've we've been together for a long time and we you know know each other very well and our styles very well uh, and she's just really good especially with this book at, um, at getting me to to focus on my audience um, she knows that audience so well from from teaching uh, that she was able to tell me right away as I was taking chapters from the rise and fall of the dinosaurs and trying to translate them into a younger readership. She would just know right away, like, you know, that's not going to do it. They're not going to get that. But at the same time, okay, you're dumbing it down too much. Use <laughs> a big word here. The kids want a big word here. So, you know, really so what me. were your, what were your biggest offenses as a, as a writer for a younger audience? What were the things that she would have to pull you back on? one of my first instincts was like let's strip out like all of the terminology let's get rid of most of these big technical words not that there were tons of those in the rise and fall of the dinosaurs but because it was a book for adults you know there, there there was some jargon in there i would be careful to define it and stuff but my instinct was to get rid of all of that and, and one of the things she told me that was just really helpful was yeah that's good of course you don't you know kids are going to gloss over lots of jargon but you want to throw them a bone every once in a while, you know, you, for kids that, that are smart and bright and enthusiastic, don't underestimate them. Like, you know, give them a, a phrase here and there, give them a new word here and there, make sure mm -hmm. you define it, but don't strip it all out. If you strip it all out, you're just taking it down to some really boring base level. And, and, I, you know, I just never, never really thought about that until she told me that when she read some of the first chapter drafts of the book. And then she went through and, and made a lot of other suggestions as well. This is apparently a kid's book, although I, I should say for our audience, it, uh, it reads really well if you're, you know, if you're not a younger reader too. The, the book that you wrote for adults, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, is, is kind of the only one of its kind, unless I've missed something that's in a field that's been flourishing for the last three decades. There haven't been many books for adults kind of written as a, as a popular understanding of what's going on in the field. And it seems to be this weird situation where publishing for young readers, um, you know, those enthusiastic you know, dinosaur fiends has been out in front of adult writing in terms of kind of keeping up with with current events in the field. Why do you think it's been so underwritten recently? I think you're spot on there. And that's one of the reasons why I, I also wanted to write The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs was because there hadn't been an adult pop science book on dinosaurs for quite some time. You know, at least one that was put out, you know, in the trade format, you know, by a, a, a trade publisher and marketed for a broad audience. I mean, there were plenty of dinosaur books, but the, the ones for adults had skewed a bit more technical. Not, not all of them. There had been some, but, but it was really a trickle. Um, whereas there just, there, there were more of them for adults, it seemed like, you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s. Now, maybe I'm wrong there. and I actually counted them up, it would be different, but I, that's the impression. Um, and certainly the, the number of children's books and particularly picture books and encyclopedias and, you know, little, little fact books and those kind of things vastly outnumbered books about dinosaurs for adults. Uh, and so I saw that as a gap, as an opportunity. I'm lucky that uh, I, you know, had a, a, a agent, Jane Van, Van Meeren, who, um, 
led me through this. You know, we we met randomly. She heard me do an interview on the radio, and she thought there was something in the way I was talking that would make an interesting book at some point. She got in touch. One thing led to another, and okay, hey, we came up with the, an idea together. And then, of course, we pitched it to different editors, and she worked her magic and found a great editor, Peter Hubbard in, in, in New York. Uh, at HarperCollins, and um, and working together there, we found, I think, a style and a narrative that fit. Uh, and so it was a process. It wasn't just something that, you know, came to me one day or something like that. I mean, maybe some people write books like that, and they just get some great idea, and it materializes. But no, I mean, it was a process. It, it took a while to get the idea down. You know, I knew I wanted it to be something on the, the evolution of dinosaurs as a whole, but it took time to flesh out that story and to, to find the right way to weave in my own stories and stories of my colleagues. Um, and, you know, it took a lot of, um, I would just say a lot of experience to, to get to that point of just doing a lot of writing starting when I was a teenager. I also worked in a newspaper, my, my hometown newspaper in, in Ottawa, Illinois, the Times, when I was in high school and college and summers and, and holidays and, and breaks and so on. And I, you know, I mostly did sports, but I did other writing over time. And I had just, you know, some editors and colleagues there, um, Lonnie Kane, Dave Wisnowski, Mike Murphy, they're the three that uh, really helped me the most. But, you know, they just learning from them, being in a newsroom, having new stories thrown at me every day. That, I learned a lot that way writing for a lot of the amateur magazines. When I did those interviews of paleontologists when I was a teenager, you know, taking those interviews, turning them into art articles, working with editors, learning how to be edited and, and so on, that, that all kind of built up to being able to be in a position to have an idea for a book. Uh, and so I, I look back on all that and, and just realize how fortunate I was that I had all those experiences and I learned so much at so many different stages from so many people. We've now caught up on the field to the point that uh, we can wait until you get your next book out on early mammals. But in the meantime, we've uh, we've got the last 20 years uh, of paleontology pretty much locked down. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Michael. Fun conversation. I love it. It's a nice little break from all the, you know, craziness and and teaching from home and working from home and everything. So thanks for indulging me in a nice conversation about dinosaurs and about writing. And, you know, for anybody out there who's interested in these books, I, I hope that there's something that catches you here. And please do get in touch. Uh, you know, people, as we've been talking about, were very generous to me when I was young and getting started. And, and so, um, if you want to get in touch, send me off an email. I'm, I, I, I try my best to uh, converse with everybody and keep up with everybody and try to just uh, give that spark as much as I can to the next generation. You heard it here. Send that email. All right. I have been speaking with Steve Brusate. His latest book is The Age of Dinosaurs, The Rise and Fall of the World's Most Remarkable Animals, which, as we've mentioned, is ostensibly a book for young readers. But if hearing him talk about dinosaurs makes you want to go really deep, you can also check out his earlier book, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, A New History of a Lost World. Steve's books, as well as the other ones we've talked about here in previous episodes of the show, can be found at kobo.com slash conversation or check the show notes. Be sure to catch every conversation by subscribing however you listen and leave us a review because it helps other readers to find us. Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Tamlin. Thank you for listening.